Hi everybody, greetings from Ireland and welcome to the second session of this Wet Felt Meets Eco Printing Bootcamp. I'm absolutely thrilled at the response that there was to session one yesterday. And I can see already that there are many people logged in tonight. So it's going to be another lively session too, I think. Um, it's great to see where you're all tuning in from. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to respond to you all individually. It's just there are too many people um, online and Sock is very kindly helping me with moderation again today. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nicola Brown. I'm a textile artist based in rural Southeast Ireland, and I'm passionate about wet felting, eco printing in the dirty pot, more about that later, and also about growing my own plants and trees to use in the dye pot. So you're all very welcome. Please feel free to drop a comment, in, enjoy the chat, see where you're all tuning in from. And what I'm actually going to do is, I'm going to recap and expand on what I talked about last night. And then I'm going to give you some tips for the studio because maybe some of you are working in a very small space and you find it difficult to work, or maybe some of you has, have physical issues and you find it difficult to felt small or large projects. So I'm going to give you some tips on those um, sorts of issues later during this live stream, but I'd like to start by recapping from yesterday and expanding on what we did. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to chat about is wet felting to eco print. So I suppose we should also ask what actually is felt? So felt is non-woven fabric. It's usually made from wool, but it can be made from plenty of different animal fibers. So you can make felt from yak, from cashmere, from alpaca, from llama, from quivet. You can felt your dog's hair. Um, if you happen to have a sheep dog, you might know sometimes you get matted hair underneath the dog's tail. Well, in effect, that's felted hair. But as a beginner or as somebody who's going to consider eco printing on their felt, I recommend that you start with wool. And one of the easiest wools to work with is merino. And there are some subtle differences with wet felting to eco print as opposed to just wet felting itself. Um, because let me go through the slides. I think that's the easiest thing. So when you are going to eco print, it's really, really important to use natural undyed wool for everything that you're making that you would like to eco print. And the reason for that is, A, you don't want any commercial dye to run out in the wash, but B, you also want to have a pale background. So your eco prints are going to stand out beautifully against what you are felting. And it is possible to use dark wool also to add, to, to emphasize sections. For example, this is a wet felted vessel. And I could have put some darker wool around the opening where the hole is in the top of this purely decorative piece. And that could have emphasized the opening even more. Or if you made a felt jacket, you might like to draw a design on the back of it in black wool, but the rest of the wool would be white. And then when you would go back to eco printing that, that black design would be on the back of the felt and it would be much more obvious after you had eco printed it. Something that I also enjoy doing as well with some of my eco printed felt is I love using an organic indigo vat afterwards. So I might dye the piece afterwards. Um, so start with natural undyed wool. Now, if you don't choose to use any embellishments, if you use natural undyed wool, creamy white wool for the felt and you eco print it, that surface of the felt is going to have a very matte finish, a sort of a flat finish. I really love this. So this piece here that you can see, this is a small sample that I felted and there are no embellishments on this side of the felt, 
But in a minute, I'm going to show you the other side, and the other side did have embellishments. So what I particularly like about this here is how there's a real sense of liveliness and depth to the background of the piece. This was a sample, and I used a few different leaves. So the bottom left-hand side um, is a, a eucalyptus cordata leaf, and then above it, there are a few sycamore leaves. And then towards the top right, there are some blackberry leaves. And then underneath my um, logo at the top there, you can see a more golden color. And that's where the copper pipe that I rolled that particular bundle on, that's where the copper made contact with the fabric. Now, normally I like to use very restrained layouts of my vegetation because I find that it actually looks I think more sophisticated when you don't have too many things just thrown on it. But if I'm doing a sample, I might choose to use several different types of vegetation. So if you then decide you are going to add embellishing fibers, if you are eco printing, it's important to understand that any fiber that comes from an animal, such as wool and silk, that fiber actually absorbs the natural dye in the dirty pot in the method of eco printing that I use and teach. It absorbs the color really readily. However, if you use cellulose fiber, which comes from a plant, things such as bamboo or tencel or banana fiber, maybe linen or soy, if you use that to embellish the top of your felt, by that I mean to decorate the top of your felt, it does not absorb the natural dye in the same way. So if you look at this image here, you can see those white wriggly little sort of bits on the surface of the felt. Those white pieces, they are actually tencel. And tencel is a beautiful fiber that comes from eucalyptus trees. It's from the pulp and it's a man-made fiber, but it is considered to be a cellulose fiber because it comes from a plant. And it's the most environmentally friendly of all the silk substitutes, because obviously some people don't want to use silk or they're only happy using piece silk. Um, you know, people who, who might be vegetarian, for example, don't may, may not want to use silk. So use a cellulose fiber if you're intending to eco print your felt. Now, here we can see here, um, this is the reverse of the piece I showed you a minute ago. So it's not only got the white uh, sort of little lines on it from the tencel, but this particular piece also has a shimmer on the surface. It's very, very reflective. And the reason for that is it's a really good tip for you. It's a fiber called Firestar. And Firestar is the trade name for it. It's not Angelina. It's different than Angelina. It's actually a trilobal nylon, and it's the only artificial fiber that I use in my textile practice. And it actually does absorb the color. So what's happened in this instance is I have two layers of merino wool as my back, my base for this felt piece. I then have tensile embellishing fibers. Those are the white fibers. And then I have an, a layer of Firestar on top of all of those. And what's happened is the tensile has not absorbed the dye color as much. So you can see those beautiful white lines. But the Firestar has, and it's providing a shimmer on top of the tensile. So you're building depth of color and interest in your piece. Moving on, here are both of those pieces side by side. So if you look on the right hand side, it's very matte. And if you look on the left hand side in this image, it's got much more reflection and shimmery. On the left hand side, that 
side of the piece is eco printed using onion skins. So I'm sure you can see and you can agree how wonderful the onion skins look there. I mean, I just adore them. But you can also see that the color from the onion skins has not come through to the back of the piece. And the purple and the more golden shades from the other leaves on the right hand side have not come through to, to the back of the piece. So that's all really um, quite interesting. So I actually see a question here from um, Linda. Could I actually ask everybody as well, please, if you're putting a question into the chat, if you can remember, if you put three question marks at the beginning and three at the end of your comment, Sock will be able to identify them better and then he can star them for me. So now, Linda, I don't know what baby doll South Down batting is. Um, I have got absolutely no idea what that is. But if you have wool bats, B-A-T-T-S, that are designed for wet felting, yes, they will wet felt very well. But there are also some wool bats, I believe, that might be used for stuffing things uh, and maybe for needle felting. They may not all work as well. So I would opt for a merino batting if I was going to use a bat or I would opt for something like Norwegian C1 wool or Bergschaft. There are a lot of beautiful wools that I love using in a bat form, but I don't know what baby doll South Down is, I'm afraid. So um, that's not something that I'm afraid I can answer for you. Um, so Donna has a question here about linen threads. Absolutely, Donna. Yes, they could. And I'm not sure if you've watched my step-by-step -step tutorial about wet felting. Clearly, yeah, I think you have wet felting experience. But for anybody who is experienced, but usually lays out their, all their layers dry, I recommend you wet and soak between the layers of your felt. And you also put a light layer of soap on top of your top layer of wool prior to putting your embellishing fibers down. And in that way, Donna, your linen fibers, if you take your time at the beginning of the felting process, they will actually, they will combine with the wool, but they will stand out more than if you just put them straight on top of the wool. So um, that's that. Um, Linda, we will be moving on to more eco printing questions in, in a minute, but in I'm just going to answer this since it's here now. So if you think of, um, let's say if you think of a diary and the diary folds in half. So for that sample piece, which I'm going to add it to the stream again so you can see it. If you look at the right hand side, you can see that there's a dark line down the middle. And the, the print on the right hand side is not a mirror image. If you look on the left hand side, you can see that it's a, the prints are a mirror image. So what I did was I laid the onion skins down on half of the felt, down the length, and I folded the other half over up the middle, um, just like closing a book. So onion skins on one side, folded the other half over, and then I laid the leaves um, from the other side um, down on top, and then I rolled it all up. So that's how, how I did that one here. And uh, Dolores, I don't think, I don't think there is another language, <laughs> another name for it, Dolores. Tencel is Tencel as far as I know. But if you remind me afterwards or send me a message on Instagram, I have a wonderful supplier that I use. Um, there's a, a very good supplier in England for embellishing fibers. It's a bit of a pain because of Brexit and we have to pay a lot more more duty but I will share um, the name of that supplier so you can have a look and see what the fire star is um, so somebody here is having an issue with the live stream to play but nobody else is having a problem with the live stream I hope so I hope everybody um, else is okay thank you very much Jody so south down wool does not wet felt very well and um, Jody is saying and thank you very much for putting that in Jody because the name when it said baby doll south down was just ringing a few alarm bells with me it wasn't anything I I really knew about so I think you would be better not to try wet felting with those bats 
And a very important point for me is your time, time is money. And it's a salutary lesson trying to work with the incorrect raw materials because you waste time you frustrate yourself and you won't end up with anything usable so actually you would be better waiting until you could buy some different wool and not bothering trying to felting at all if you don't have the correct supply so that is just something to um to actually bear in mind um so i'm just going to move on now to to the next of these slides here so this is something that i do a lot and i personally find very interesting so I also use fabric as an embellishment on my felt at times. And at other times I use fabric to strengthen the, the piece. So if you look at this image here, th this is a felt wall piece. If you look at the bottom right hand section there, that little triangular bit where you can see the slightly darker edge to the piece. If you notice there, there's a rather an obvious line along the whole outside edge. So the darker bit is actually wool, um, just the very outside edge, it got more color from the pot, but where that line is, that's where the edge of my silk fabric is. So for the layout of this specific piece, I have two layers of wool. I have one solid piece of Pongé silk, a five mommy piece of silk. And then I've put embellishing fibers on top of the silk as well. So you can build up different layers. And in that way, you can have different effects because you can also, you can lay your eco printing vegetation on the wool side, or you can lay it on the silk side. So each thing you do is going to have an impact in your finished piece. What I really want to give you here in the boot camp is a feel for the possibility and the potential of all of this and cut through to the chase and just give you some basic tips that I hope will really, really help you in the um, future. So now I'm going to move on to the next slide. So this is a Nuno felt wrap. And as with anything that's reversible, you can lay the vegetation, as I've already said, on either side. So if you look around the model, around her head, Ashina was her name, you can actually see that it looks quite soft and sort of fluttery around by the back of her head. I have a silk ruffle on both the long edges of this scarf. I have a deep ruffle on one edge and I have a narrow ruffle or a narrow ur ruffle on the other. And I love the contrast of the eco prints on the silk so there's no wool on either of those ruffles and there is wool on the rest of the piece. This is a very light, very, very light Nuna felt piece. And Nuna felt takes the, the eco printing wonderfully. But if I go back to the previous slide, you can see how crisp and sharp these prints are. And you can see that this is more abstract. And there are some obvious prints on the scarf, but the overall effect is more abstract. And the reason for that is that some of the vegetation is so powerful and the Nuno felt, the combination of silk and wool in this piece is so fine that that vegetation repeat prints on, or shadows along the length of the wrap. So it's a more abstract effect. And I must say, I really like that. And um, there is a question here from Janet, which I am going to pop up on the screen. So Janet, um, you won't get fuchsia, emerald or sky blue without using either a mordant and natural dyes or an over dye in indigo for the blue afterwards. So my speciality is eco printing without using powdered mordants. There's a phrase called eco printing in the dirty pot. I'm actually going to just put a link up in the chat now. I have a book for those of you who might be interested in diving deep into the foundations of that. And I'll actually just pin that comment up at the very, oh, it's not allowing me. Is it? Uh, yeah, I'm going. Oh, that's very strange. It's not allowing me pin the comment to the top of the post. Um, 
So I'm afraid I can't pin it, but there is a link to, to the book in my video description for anybody who might be interesting or interested afterwards in looking at that. But um, the colors that I achieve are not really bright and vibrant per se, although it is possible to get some very bright and vibrant color. But things like a bright fuchsia, for example, you would need to use something like cochineal, you would need to mordant to your fabric. And that's not what I'm doing in the dirty pot. So I'm sorry about that, Janet. It is um, possible to get those colors. Um, if you are interested in working with somebody and you want to work with powdered mordants, I highly recommend Caroline Nixon. And Caroline is my good buddy who I interviewed and showed that little video of yesterday. And at the end of this week, I'm going to put the link to Caroline's website in the video description for day one. So if anybody is interested in doing a workshop and working with powdered mordants, I highly recommend that you do that with Caroline. So I'm going to move on to, um, let's just see this one here. Um, this one here also has um, silk. And so this has a layer of silk fabric and this has, um, fine layer of wool and um, Adriana or Adriana has a very interesting question here and um, so if you put silk on top you don't have to fix it with another wool layer absolutely not the wool fiber underneath that wool fiber let me just get myself back in here for a second so let's say that this cloth which is what I've it was cleaning my screen with. So say this is the silk fa fabric and you have two layers or one layer of wool underneath. If it's a Nuno felt scarf, I would just have one very fine layer of wool. But if it was a wool piece, I would have two. So as I start to rub and the wool fibers start to come together, the little tips of the wool fibers also go up through the weave. And so what happens then is as the wool fiber shrinks providing you haven't been too aggressive at the beginning of the wet felting process it's important to take your time so providing you've been been gentle at the beginning and the fibers start to come through then as the wool shrinks it grabs hold and it crinkles the the silk fabric so let me just um go back for one second now so you can see there's some texture on the surface of that piece. So that is the silk fabric there with two layers of wool behind it. The more wool you have, the less texture you will have with your silk. The less wool, the more texture. And this particular piece here, this sold when I was facilitating um, a residential workshop in Australia. And another artist, a wonderful leather um, shoe and handbag maker bought this. And this particular piece was fully reversible. Um, it could be actually worn. Um, it had a V neck on one, one side of it, a, a round neck at the other. And it could, unless you had a very big bust, it could be worn. Um, with either neckline to the front and also it could be turned inside out and it was totally different on the other side. Um, so you don't need to fix the silk and Nuno felt is something that I will really be covering extensively. Um, I'm absolutely confident everybody loves Nuno felting. I will be really going into that in great detail in the membership program which launches later this week. So if you are going to eco print fabric which you want to include in your felt so these ones here were felted in white and then they were eco printed this little neck piece here this is a natural gray merino wool from portugal and i've incorporated some eco printed silk in this piece so when you are going to eco print with uh, on fabric and incorporated into felt it's much better to use a dark fiber behind and you get by far the best results and here is a good example this is um one of my wall hangings from my dry stone wall series and this piece uh 
has two layers of a fine merino, actually merino bats. It's 19.5 micron. And this piece, it's not huge, but it's not that small. Um, that's a door to the right of it. So it's, it's a good size. This piece started out very, very, very much bigger. And all those stones, for want of a better word, um, it's based on the dry stone wall. They all started very, very much bigger than that. And so I would have worked in reverse in this piece. So in this case, I laid down my design with the stones, with the top surface of those stones face down on my table. And then I added in the wool behind. So in that case, it was easier to have the the silk stones upside down on the table, then my two layers of wool, that was all felted together and at the end then turned over. And you might be asking um, how you can get more crisp edges to, to your silk fabric. Um, I will give you that as a tip in just a minute. But if you look at this image here, you can see how the texture of the, the surface where the silk fabric is, look how beautifully it's crinkled. Now, I'm also going to share towards the end of our time together one way that I find I can maximize the enjoyment of laying out pieces, but not have as much physical rubbing and rolling. And I've learned that using the particular method that I'm going to share with you, I can actually use very much heavier silk than I would otherwise use. It's There's no problem whatsoever in getting um, silk that's say 14 mame to felt in and that would provide even more crinkle. So the higher the mame, the more the silk crinkles. Um, also, you can use other fabric as well. That could be cotton gauze. But if you're eco printing, the cotton gauze won't take the eco printed color so well. And I'm really using my eco printing for this. Now, it took me a long time to get some. I was visiting my great friend Dawn Edwards in America. I think the first time I got freezer paper because we really um, don't appear to have access to it easily here in Ireland. But it is an absolute miracle um, thing to have. And I'm sure some of you are probably quilters as well. I believe people who quilt are used to freezer paper. So what I do is I get the silk that I'm intending on making a shape uh, from. I just put the silk face down on the table and then I put the sort of waxy side of the freezer paper down on it and then I iron on the paper side. So what happens is the silk sticks to the freezer paper and then using not your best fabric scissors, you can cut any shape you like, you can cut it out and then you just peel the silk or the fabric off the paper and you can use it. And the marvelous thing about that as well is you can actually reuse whatever shapes you're using. You can iron them on multiple times. So that's a really, really, really good tip. But I would also say if you decide you're doing a piece like that, those stones look fairly close together in that image. But I had a very, very obvious gap between each of them when I was laying out the wall hanging because I knew that when the wool would shrink it would all get much closer together so I wouldn't recommend you do any really really fiddly little um little designs I would recommend that you did um more striking designs and another wonderful thing about using your silk like this is because the silk is also going to crinkle during the felting process, that um, you actually can use silk that you're really, really not happy with, or you could use a wool gauze as well, for example, um, for your eco printing, and then incorporate that into your felt. But you can use pieces that you're really not over enthused with, rather than trying to reprint them or give them work out what to do with them. And they are utterly transformed by the color of the wool that you put behind. Um, so I'm just going to add.
I stopped. And you can't actually see it that clearly there I don't think but all those bricks in the road those individual pieces they all had very different colors of wool behind them so some of them had purple wool some had raspberry color wool some had orange some had yellow and then when I laid the whole piece out the more mottledy orangey color or or more golden color on either side of the path that was also a ginormous piece of eco printed silk and in the case of this particular um piece on the back i have turban cotton so this is one large piece of turban cotton two layers of wool and then the embellishments on top and it was all laid in reverse so it started with the embellishments face down on the table two layers of wool, the big piece of turban cotton to pull everything together, uh, and that's that. So experiment by making pre-felt and cut it to shape, and that just gives you another, um, another option. So I'm just going to go down now and just check a few, few um, questions um, before, um, let me see here, so... Oh, thank you so much, Susan. I see you purchased the book and it's a great resource. Thank you very, very much. Um, that's really kind of you. Um, Dolores, I'm not quite sure the pin for the book went through. I'm not quite sure what you mean for that, but there is um, a link to the book in the video description. So you can see that afterwards. Um, so Donna, thank you. That particular Nuno scarf was eucalyptus parvifolia, but mainly onion skins. Um, so, haha, Laura, we must be on the same sort of wavelength. Yes, I have. So now I, I have used cochineal bugs directly on my fabric, just as an experiment. It was on fabric that was not mordanted, but there was a lot of iron in the pot. And I got wonderful prints, Laura, but what from the bugs? Purple, purpley, from cerise to purple. But what was really, really interesting was they affected the other leaves that I was using. So I was using smoke bush or cotinus leaves, which give me a very good purple. And when I combined them, I did the experiment with the bugs. I was using the the Cotinus, I had great results. The next day I combined the two of them in one piece and it was as if the cochineal drove all the color out of the, the cotinus leaves. And I had a black outline of the leaves and no color. It was the weirdest thing. And I did, I tried it on a few pieces. There was a very strange reaction. So yes, I have printed with them, but I need to do more. I, I can't, um, I, I can't, um, say any more than that here's a question from sophie um so the night the light nuno felt it was a very large piece of silk not lyocell it was silk with a very small quantity of merino 19.5 micron merino and then there were embellishing fibers so the silk if i'm making a scarf the most the most popular size scarf for customers in Ireland and probably Europe is one meter 80 by 45. Um, that's just a regular scarf size. But if you were going to be felting something, it's going to shrink a lot more. So you need to make it a few meters long if you want a decent sized scarf. Um, so this question here, when do you eco print before or after adding the silk? So I'm discussing the two different um, two different techniques here. So they're not they're not to be confused. So I'm just going to go back here. So this piece here was felted fully. So all the wool and the silk fabric and the embellishments that was felted until it was totally finished. It was a white piece of felt, and then that was eco printed. This piece here. The silk fabric was eco printed and washed and finished. So I had eco printed fabric and then I incorporated that into my felt. So I'm just. Um, 
this is an excellent question, Tina. Is the, and, and I am going to talk a little bit about eco printing in a minute. So uh, I um, don't want to get ahead of myself here, but I will answer this question here. When you are eco printing in the dirty pot, it does not matter what the fabric is that you are printing, you are going to boil the pieces for the length of time that the vegetation requires. So Nuno felt takes the same length of time as, as felt with no silk or as a wool scarf or as a mohair jumper. They all take exactly the same length of time for processing. You determine the length of time on the processing depending on the vegetation. And again, my eco printing book goes through that in a lot more detail, but I obviously don't want you all to have to buy the book. Although of course I'd love if some of you <laughs> buy the book, but um, I also have a lot more information in my previous online bootcamp here on U YouTube. So that's eco printing in the dirty pot. But at a rough guide, onion skins and softer vegetation such as rose leaves or blackberry leaves, they give their best prints between two and two and a half hours. And then eucalyptus leaves, when you're working without powdered mordants, they need anywhere from two and a half up to five hours to release their color. So I'm just going to move on. Okay, so that is that section there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just recap a little bit about eco printing, and then I'm going to give you some tips um, for saving yourself in the studio and working in a small space. And then I will answer your questions. And then we have tomorrow to go as well. So tomorrow is all about creating sculptural felt and eco printing sculptural felt. So here we go um, with this bit here. Hang on a second.
It won't absorb the natural dye color as well. And you run the risk of it being extremely crinkled afterwards. So I think that's a very important point. I would always um, soak my pieces very, very well before I um, you don't have to give it the overnight soak. So that's just something to consider. Um, you don't wet felted. Um, so I'm just... It's not wanting you to see. Um, sorry, just give me one second. Okay, here we are. I'm not quite sure. It seems to be cutting out of this. Let's hope you can see this now. So the other sort of supplies that you need, they include just metal pipes that you could roll your pieces up on. Copper plumbing pipe is excellent for giving more gold tones and rusty metal pipes give me my favorite darker tones. I've got vinegar there. It does not matter what your vinegar is. It could be white vinegar, malt vinegar. I've used wine that had gone off. But don't use lemon juice because that's going to bleach the color away and we want to keep the color. And you're going to need scissors and vegetation. So the best pot to start with is an aluminium pot and add a good chunk of rusty metal to the pot. And that will help you achieve strong, washable and light fast prints. My favorite pot of all is cast iron, but some people would find that the prints from that might be too dark for their liking. But I really love the depth of the background color, all that sort of mottled and gray color in the background. And I love the strength of prints that come from the cast iron pot. There's another example of that there now. So I'm just going to pop down through the questions for a second here and just see, is there anything on what I've been talking about? And then I'm going to give you a few tips for, for um, making things easier in the studio. Um, so Tracy, I have got mine when I'm traveling in America. I know you could probably get it from sewing supply shops anywhere that there are quilters. And I will have a look for some online and I will actually add it to my own Amazon storefront. So I have an Amazon storefront. I'm not encouraging everybody to buy from Amazon when you can buy locally, but there are things that, that I can't get, for example, here in Ireland. And so I've collated some of my favorite studio supplies and I will add the freezer paper to that. Um, so <laughs> I don't use tannin and iron reactions in the dirty pot usually. It's not something for this particular um, boot camp. However, if you do want your eucalyptus prints to be red, it's important to use eucalyptus leaves from a tree that prints red. So eucalyptus cordata, for example, eucalyptus cinerea, which is often sold by the florists a silver dollar, they all give a red. And without using a tannin blanket, and I'm really afraid I can't pronounce your name Looking at it, I know it's not Julia, but I'm really sorry about that. But if I wanted to get very, very dark background color and red prints, I'm not suggesting anybody else tries this, but if I wanted to get that, I think the best thing to do would be to do a pomegranate soak of the fabric beforehand, to use leaves that I knew would print very red and to print in a cast iron pot and roll up on a rusty metal pipe. So. I'm not, that's not the topic of this boot camp. It will be something that we will go into in more detail in the membership, but that would be my recommendation, pomegranate and iron. So I'm just scrolling down to see has Sock highlight some more questions here. Okay, so um, Kate, so turban cotton is the fabric that a Sikh would wear, like a turban for your head. So um, 
it's a very, very long length of cotton. It's a light cotton. It's a beautiful weight and it, it felt really beautifully. Um, so in Ireland, we call cheesecloth what other people might call muslin or we call muslin what other people might call cheesecloth, but a, a cotton gauze, turban cotton, is, is it closer weave than a gauze? I'm afraid I'm not quite sure how to describe it except for that. So if you go to an Indian store, for example, um, if you go somewhere that sells saris in Birmingham or maybe in, in Canada, and if you ask anybody there, if you go to a fabric shop and you ask for a turban cotton, it's a specific length and it's absolutely wonderful, um, wonderful to Nuna felt with. Um, so Terry, please go back and explain pre-felt. So Terry, pre-felt is when you lay out your piece of felt, you start making your felt, and then when the fibers start to come together and you've got your felt, but before it's done a lot of shrinking, you stop the process. You might choose to wash the soap out. I don't personally bother. And you let that piece dry. So what you have is a piece of fabric that has started to shrink, but the majority of the shrinking process hasn't occurred. And so that means that you can cut it into shapes with a crisp edge, and then you can add those shapes on top of your other fiber when you're laying a new piece of felt out. And those shapes will keep, let's say it's a circle, it will keep that circular shape. So it's got a much crisper edge. So that's what pre-felt is. Um, not the bugs, the cochineal bugs were not alive when I was when I was using them. No, you when you buy them, you buy them dried. Um, okay, now this is great, uh, super tip. So thank you very much, Deirdre. So you can spray starch on the back of silk fiber and iron with baking paper. Yes, yes, you can. You can make silk paper and you can do it. That That's very good. And there will be tutorials, I'm sure, on the internet for anybody interested in making silk paper. But that's really good tip. Thank you very much for that, Georgia. Um, okay. So, Joan, if I'm... Um, if I'm felting, or if I'm sorry, if I'm eco printing a silk scarf and I personally am going to sell that scarf and I'm not felting it, I like to use a heavy weight, probably a 14.5 mame or a 12.5. But most of the heavier satin scarves that I sell are at least a 14 mame. I feel it's well worth spending the extra money on them and I always buy them with hand rolled edges. I buy from a trade supplier, so I'm afraid I can't give you um, I can't give you the details because they don't deal with retail people. Um, but that's what I would choose if I'm going to be including my fabric in Nuno felting. I will opt for anything up to a 14 mame and pange or habitai, what some people call it. That silk actually felt very very well, and any anywhere between five and eight mame is good for nuno felting i'm not a believer that you need to to have very very low mame and very light silk I, i'm more than happy to use even heavier than that because if you take your time at the beginning and you allow the wool fiber to migrate through the silk you'll have a beautiful piece at the end so okay um, I see there's a few things with the sound. It's definitely some, can everybody hear me now? Oh, no. Can, could somebody just write into the comment? Can you, can somebody just answer me? Can you actually hear me now? Okay, thanks very much, Esther. Something was a little bit strange um, with how I shared those last images. So I think what I, what I will do is I'm not gonna share them again. And um, then that might um, that might be the answer. I'm I'm very sorry about that. If you couldn't hear me for a few minutes, so um, yes, my book gives a basic list of plants that will work very well in the dirty pot using this method, and it also gives the recommended processing time for those plants. It does, yes. 
And the thing is that um, you always think, or most people think the grass is greener somewhere else. You're going to find that there's something in your own backyard or that you can access in a town near you in a, in a park or something um, or on the side of the road that's going to work really well where you live. So it's important to get to know the vegetation where you live. And my best tip if you are experimenting and you are trying to identify what works is not to vomit, not to get sick with all this <laughs> loads of different types of leaves on, on a piece. Just do some samples with only one leaf on each sample. Well, with more than one leaf, but the same variety of plant on each sample. Some leaves um, down, some turned over the other way and take loads of photographs with your camera as you're working and make notes. And that way you will identify what does work and what doesn't work. So, um, but there is, is a list in, in the book for plants. And uh, following on from that, Dorothy's question, can you over-process and boil? You're not going to actually have a detrimental effect on your fabric, Dorothy, but yes. So with, on, with um, blackberry leaves, for example, late in the season, I find they get beautiful prints after about two and a half hours, lovely purples. But if I go over that time, that all shifts to brown and muddy colors, and then they deteriorate the longer they're in the pot. Early in the season, I find they give their best prints after about two hours. And the reason I know that they are that they don't need longer is if I if they look slightly mushy when you're opening your bundle, they have had too long in the pot processing, but they need to have long enough to release the dye. So it's a fine tuning thing, but the ebook does give recommended times for different vegetation. And I would say, as a general rule, two and a half hours in the dirty pot for any soft leaf. And you can give a little bit longer for, for um, a loud leaf. Um, so I'm really um, sorry about the fact that some of you missed sound. And I think that that's on my end. But anyway, it's back now. So Donna, my pipes are about one inch narrower on each end than the widest, the, than the diameter of my pot. Because once you start putting vegetation onto your pipes, um, you won't fit them in your pot if they are any wider. So you need to get the biggest pot possible and the pipes can be an inch or two narrower than that. Um, so Laura, um, there isn't really a way to check during the process if you are trying eucalyptus for the first time if i have new eucalyptus leaves i always boil them for five hours if they have given no red after five hours they're not going to give red uh if they've given red i would then um bring that down to maybe three hours and if they have given red after three hours um I would bring it down and I would try two and a half, but I would always do two and a half or longer for eucalyptus for the best prints. So there's no way when you don't know the leaves, but I would say that Cinerea um, usually gives good reds after two and a half hours working in the dirty pot. When you work with mordants, many people say, oh, you don't need that length of time, but they're working with mordants. So just remember that. Um, so my big pot, um, my the outside jan of my pot is galvanized but that's only what is holding the pot the pot sits in that and the pot has a curved bottom and i there's a wood fired um it's fired by wood underneath so in fact the whole inner of that it's all cast iron it's not aluminium and somebody was asking where I got the pot from and I found it on one of my trips with my buddy Caroline in France and um, it was in a wonderful brocante it's like a cross between an antique and a salvage yard and since I have my pickup truck I was able to buy it and bring it home and um, yes rebar works brilliantly Donna it works really really well Julia, no, I have as sustainable a textile practice as I possibly can. I do use um, bubble wrap for, eco, uh, for my felting, but I try not to use plastic in the studio if at all possible. So I don't, because I'm submerging all these bundles into the pots, um, I don't need any plastic at all. And then if I decide I'm doing a tannin and iron reaction, which isn't the topic of this particular boot camp, I would be steaming. And for that, I use waxed paper, or you can use parchment paper, 
or you might know something called baking paper. So I would use paper as my barrier, a waxed paper, not plastic. Um, so I haven't, Esther, um, I haven't processed in a zinc pot, but I love zinc pipes and they give interesting modifications. So I would say you will get some very interesting effects from a zinc pot and good for you. We don't have uh, big vintage pots like that here in Ireland. So good for you finding one. Um, so I'm going to just not look at questions now for a minute. I, I want to just talk a short, a small bit, as I promised, about a couple of ways of making life a little bit easier for you for maybe for your if, if you have, um, we'll start with felting. Let's say you have some physical um, issues or you find the rubbing and the rolling very, very time consuming and very hard. You can actually use a tumble dryer to help you with the felting process. Now I'm not talking about a washing machine. I'm talking about the dryer that you would dry clothes in. And in order to do that, what you need to do is rather than laying out your felt on bubble wrap, what you would get is painter's plastic, you know, that plastic drop cloth from the hardware store that you would maybe cover your furniture with if you were doing some painting. And instead of laying the wool fiber on bubble wrap, you would just lay it onto the painter's plastic and you would lay the fiber out in the same way as usual. But then you would roll the whole thing up. So let me just see. I, I don't have any images and I don't want to lose, lose you again the... There. So let's just say this is the bundle rolled up. So I've now got I've got a layer of, of painter's plastic. I've got my felt on top and I've rolled it up. So what I would do then is I would tie it on both ends using um, something like T-shirt yarn. And I would tie it once in the middle quite firmly. And then I would roll it up inside a towel and I would tie it. Tie the towel on the outside of that as well. So it's, it's rolled up and it's tied within the plastic. Then it's rolled up in a towel and it's tied. And then I would curve it like this and I would put it in my tumble dryer with maybe some denims or something that's going to bang around a bit and balance the drum because you don't want to put some heavy felt in and have your tumble dryer broken because you don't have a balanced load in it. So you would give it 10 minutes. You would open, take it out. You would unroll your piece. And as... This mightn't be very easy to show. So as I would unroll the piece, I'm looking at the felt here at the wool, I would start to roll it up here and I would just keep opening it, checking it and rolling it from the other way. So that by the time I've got to the other end, the whole piece has been rolled up from the other direction and that then gets tied again. And then that goes in the tumble dryer for 15 minutes. So I usually do 10 or 12 minutes for the first session. And then I repeat the process. I usually do about three 15 minute sessions. And the big thing to say is you would use more soap and less water if you're going to use a tumble dryer. But trust me, it works absolutely brilliantly. And it really just removes a lot of that hard work rubbing and rolling. So I am going to at some stage, do a little video for that for YouTube, but it won't be in the short term because I'm working on the membership um, program and with the new members. But um, I will do a little bit more about that for YouTube on another occasion. But that is one way that you can avoid um, some of that physical work from the rubbing and rolling. And you can also use that if you're careful the tumble dryer method when you're making sculptural felt, but you need to be very careful and have a little bit of experience with sculptural felt before go into all the um, important info about making sculptural felt and eco printing it. So another thing I find very handy is I would batch wash, wash my fabric prior to eco printing. And I would also batch wash everything after eco printing in my washing machine. So I would make an olive oil soap solution. You can check out my video about how I would do that, but I would grate the soap, add some hot water, and I would put that liquid soap into the machine with my silk or my wool or my felt. And I put it through the wool cycle in my washing machine. Now, it's important that you do not put felt 
into your washing machine and do that wool cycle unless you are quite confident that the felt is very well made and it's not going to shrink any further. But because I'm careful when I'm making my pieces and I make sure there's no shrinkage left, I want to be confident that any customer can buy a piece of mine and if they wash it aggressively, it won't get any smaller. So I have no problem putting my felt through the machine. So definitely batch washing pieces that are eco printed with the same vegetation, that really saves a lot of time. And then when they come out of the washing machine, just iron them all together as well at the same time. And I iron everything, including my felt. So that's another tip. But something that's also really, really fantastic is, um, I wrote the name, here we go. So a centrifugal spinner. Now, some of you may know these if you are familiar with going to swimming pools where they have these. So it's like a little spinner machine and it, spin, you know, it spins the, the water out. So I have um, a secondhand one of those. I actually have two secondhand ones, thanks to Chrissy Day and her husband, Nigel, who brought one over from England. And I also picked up a second one in France. They are absolutely wonderful because... You may find that your arms or, or your elbows, you might have tennis elbow or you might have a problem with your wrist. And sometimes you want to squeeze water out of your felt or out of your eco printed fabric, but you haven't got the strength to do it or it's hurting a part of your body. So if you have that spinner, it's definitely as a professional textile artist, I cannot recommend enough that you buy one of them. I do have them um, linked on my Amazon storefront because really that was a, a game changer for me. But if you have, you don't have one or you don't want to spend the money on one, um, I think a salad spinner for small items actually works very well. So um, the salad spinner would be that plastic container and there's a handle on the top and you go like that. Or you may have a front loading washing machine and be able to spin your pieces in that. But, but I do find that really, really helpful. Then if you're working in a small space, you can scroll your work. And that's, let's say this is a piece of felt. Uh, it's similar to what I was showing you with rolling up the felt. So instead of having your whole piece of felt across the table, down the length, if you have a very small space, you might work across and you would just lay your bubble wrap over the edge of the table and you would start laying out your wool. And then when you get to the edge of the table, you would roll this up, you would pull the next piece of plastic on and you would just work on the piece in front of you that you can see. And I actually taught my first ever workshop um, was in San Francisco in the Mission District. And there were four workshop participants and it was a wonderful studio. And when I got there, we just had the tiniest space to work in, the tiniest space. So that's exactly what we had to do. Everybody was facing a wall and they worked across the table. They shared tables and they made really beautiful pieces. So you can work in a small space as well. And I might, um, if you have questions about that, you can ask them um, to me. So I'm going to go back into the comments now and I'm just going to see, I'll answer a few more questions. And I think then we will call it quits for tonight then um, after I answer some more of um these questions and then please if you're enjoying this and getting value out of the video please uh, like like the video but I'd really appreciate if you um, subscribe to the channel if you'd like more information like this but I'd love you to share it with other people so we have more people tomorrow night okay so I'm going to go down through these questions here now um, how long can I keep the bundles ready rolled until I boil them okay Laura you can roll them and I would say the maximum is to leave them overnight. And if you are going to do that, you need to wrap them up very well and put them somewhere like a fridge and keep them moist. If the bundles dry out at all, you are not going to get anything like the results you're looking for because your fabric won't ab absorb as much dye and you will also not, um, you'll get more creases. So, um, you can roll them the night before you can put them in, say, plastic shopping bag if, if if you have something like that to hand um I try not to use plastic shopping bags but often people will give you something in one so roll them in a plastic bag maybe wrap them in a towel then and put them in your fridge do not under any circumstances let them dry out um so in relation to silk um Aranita 
silk and cotton, it depends on which, uh, on how thick it is. I mean, cotton, I don't have a problem felting cotton and some cotton gauze is very beautiful, but I do have a problem eco printing cotton. I use a different method. Usually I, I do a rust water dip for cotton. So for me, I prefer with my felt, I prefer if I'm making felt to print, I prefer to use silk and wool, but in relation to whether they felt, they both felt easily. Okay, so if you're going to soak a felted piece with a strong pomegranate solution as a mordant, well, first of all, I wouldn't soak it with a strong solution, or you may end up with a whole black piece and no prints. So you have to be very, very careful with pomegranate. It sounds so easy if you have some experience with natural dye, but what you would need to do is soak your piece overnight in cold water, then put it into the pomegranate solution for a couple of hours and then go ahead. But this, I, I really don't want everyone else getting into this because this is not the topic of this workshop. Um, Katie, um, yeah, you have got to get rinsed the soap, like you've rinsed the soap out of your felt before you print it. So the soap is quite... Um, alkaline and it's much you get much better eco prints when you're working in a more acidic environment that's why we're adding vinegar so i would never ever put soapy things into the eco printing pot i mean i haven't i haven't done it but that's the whole reason that you're using the vinegar as well so i would definitely not recommend that you put anything soapy into the pot um so um dorothy i would never ever let the rolls get dry. You will not be happy with your results. You will not get, get good results. Pop them in your fridge or something and um, then leave them like that. Um, so Linda's saying, yep, Dharma Trading does sell silk scarves. I'm just going down now. If you have any questions, please pop them now into the, um, pop them into the chat, okay. Yeah, Tammy, you obviously have it in your grocery store. I'm absolutely sure it is. And, and it's also like a waxed butcher's paper. I would suggest you just try it and see if it works. But I'm absolutely sure we just don't have it available here in Ireland, unfortunately. Um, so, um, Sophie, that's something that you only know with experience. But if you look at my wet felting video, the step-by-step -step wet felting tutorial you will see the pace at which i am working and you have to wait and see you can actually see the wool fibers up on the top of your silk if you are doing um working with silk and wool so if you look at my video you will see the pace at which i work and then you will have an idea of how long that might take um so monica um there is no problem combining rose leaves, onion skins, and eucalyptus. I'm assuming you mean in that um, image I showed you, and I don't want to show you that image again because um, for some reason something has happened, and every time I was showing it, people couldn't hear me. Um, there's no problem mixing vegetation, but there is an issue. If you mix vegetation, there are two issues. It can look very... It's not very design led sometimes if you've too many different types of vegetation, unless you have a lot of experience and you have a good eye, it can just look messy to my, my, from my personal taste. So I prefer working with more restrained vegetation, plenty of the one type of vegetation, but you run into another, another problem because eucalyptus tend to need a lot longer processing time than onion skins or rose leaves. So if rose leaves and onion skins like two to two and a half hours, which is their preferred time, and you have a eucalyptus leaf that likes four hours, you're going to really either have not good prints from the eucalyptus, or you're going to be very disappointed with the rose leaf prints. Onion skin actually can cope with the longer um, processing time, so that's fine. Now, I put one eucalyptus cordata leaf into my sample because I knew that that would give color after two hours. So I knew my leaf. If you know your leaves, you can play around, but I don't recommend putting a whole load of different leaves on the one piece, um, just for clarity's sake and from the design perspective. Um, 
so I'm going down. So Jean, um, yeah, so it depends on the size of your pot, Jean. So my bigger pots, including the 40 liter aluminium one that you saw a photo of earlier, um, you don't want to cram your bundles in anyway. You want to have liquid on top of them so that there's liquid floating or flowing around the bundles. And if you have a lid that's a little bit bumpy and steam is escaping, you need to check it. But with my lids, they fit very well. So I would check on the half hour, on the hour. And if everything was looking good, I would leave it. But if it needed to be topped up, I would top it up at that stage. So you definitely need to, to, to look at them. And the, a question did um, come in afterwards last night about a fish um, kettle. And Laura's saying she uses a fish pot and she found it on eBay. That's great. Um, that's great, Laura. I find them wonderful. Fish kettles are brilliant, but you definitely need to keep topping them up. Or in my experience, I need to top mine up because they seem to, um, it evaporates quickly. Thanks, Lexi. So yes, observation, experimentation. Um, uh, thanks very much for saying you love the eco printing book and sharing the knowledge. You're very welcome. And um, so I'm not quite sure what you mean, Jean, by saying felt fluff is dry. I don't know what that means, I'm afraid. Um, I always eco print my felt when it is wet. You have to do your wet the felt as well. Now, if you want to add a comment in at the bottom, Jean, um, we might still get at a question about that, but I don't understand what you mean about, about felt fluff. Uh, Monica, thanks. You're welcome about the dryer. I will make a video about that at some stage, but that will definitely be something in the membership program. And Katie has a question about the membership program. Now, I wasn't really going to mention it today, but the membership program, it's launching on Thursday evening after the boot camp is over. And it's going to be open for registration right up until one minute to midnight on Sunday night. And that's it. So um, if you're enjoying and getting value out of all of this and you would like to have, um, I suppose it's like a fast track. It's, it's like cutting through all the nonsense so you can get from where you are now, whether you're a beginner or more experienced, where you are now to where you want to go with the least possible fuss. That's what I hope the membership program is going to provide for people. And for this very first offering of it, as I say, it's got a very, very limited um, registration um, time. It's from six o'clock on Thursday evening up until midnight, one minute to midnight on Sunday evening. I'm offering it at 50% less than it will be when it is released uh, again. So it's going to be either an annual fee of 490 euros for people who want that annual subscription, or there is a payment option of $49 a month. Those are US dollars. And to put it in perspective, my online workshops, previous workshops, six module online workshops were $200. And they had a start and an end date and plenty of feedback, obviously, plenty of information. But the I'm going to explain all about the membership on on Thursday, but it's going to there's going to be a library with all sorts of information, but cutting to the chase, videos and um, texts, and then I'm going to be um, doing a live intensive training just for group members every month, and then I'm going to be also having um, a live question and answer session every month. We're going to be having challenges. We're going to be having things that we do together. And so if you really would like an ongoing relationship and me to help you develop your own textile practice, um, this is the time to join. The reason it is going to be 50% less in this intake is because th these people are going to be founding members. So everybody who joins me will actually, I will be asking questions and asking you as well, how can I improve? What can I do? What would you like to see more of? Is there anything you don't want to? So you will be helping me build out the program. But I have loads of content um, to share and loads of tips and advice and so many ideas. My head is buzzing. Okay, so thanks for asking, Katie. And Thursday is the day that there will be more information about that. Uh, Jean, very good question. They both work. Um, if you use the heat very, very hot, you may find that your felt, that the fibers come together a little bit too quickly. But actually, I just use heat on mine. I don't have an air, air um, setting 
when I started using the tumble dryer and experimenting, I thought air was better, but I have heat on mine. So long as you do the 10 minutes and then you, you move up to the 15, don't do 15 for the first because you need to stretch it and move it around a little bit. Okay. Um, okay. So Carol is saying raw wool. I do felt with, oh, oh, she uses, oh, Carol. Yes. So you use your, your, um, when you're washing your raw wool and, um, here we have a Jane good quality salad spinner. Yep. So Valerie, um, the spinning is to help save your body really because um uh, towards the end of the felting process you need to wash the soap out of your felt and then you would continue to felt it but once you wash the soap out you need to re you know squeeze the felt to get the most of the liquid out so the spinning takes a lot of pressure off your arms i've done some very big projects and it's really really difficult to get all to get as much water out as i need whereas if it goes into the spinner it's a matter of 30 seconds and the job is done it's also fantastic if you're hand washing your items and you don't want to put them through the washing machine if you're hand washing your items you can just spin the water out so eco printed things so that's why i like to use that um so janice Yes, I use heat in the dryer, but you don't have to use heat in the dryer. You can just use air. And it's a matter of experimentation as well and, and trying both and seeing what you like, if the quality of felt is better with one over the other. Um, so, um, Valerie, um, I don't mind eco printing inside so long as there is some ventilation. But as a, as a rule, it's better to do it outside if you can. But if it's very cold now, of course, I would be doing it inside. Absolutely. You can wear a mask or you can make sure there's ventilation in the room, room you're working. Absolutely. Um, it is also possible to eco print in the microwave. That's not a topic for now, but it is something that I will be doing at a later day, date. Um, OK, I'm just scrolling down. Um, so can the lanolin in a poorly washed fleece interfere with felting? So I'm not a chemist as such, but I often, well, not often at the moment because I don't have so much time, but I love felting raw fleece. And providing you take your time and you use more soap and less water, you'll be washing the, the lanolin will come out during the felting process. So I would say if it's a poorly washed fleece, no, it won't. It may make the felting process very slightly smaller, but it won't prevent the wool felting. Um, you really need, uh, okay, so rinsing the felt, you really, really need to look at the wet felting video, the step-by-step -step tutorial, because I'm not, I'm not going into the whole felting process in this boot camp. but if you look at that, you'll see exactly, um, at what stage I would rinse the felt. So when when the felt has come together and it's almost fully shrunk to the size I want it to be, at that stage, I would give my felt a very good wash. And then I would do the final few rolls and stretching with no soap in the piece. I would do that in a linen tea towel or a linen towel. So if you look at that, that um, full step-by-step -step felting video, you will see the instructions for that. Um, yeah, Esther, I um, I do overprint pieces that I'm not happy with, but I don't print with eucalyptus and then add the other leaves in the next time around purely because I prefer what I call extra virgin printing. I prefer either eucalyptus leaves or let's say sycamore or cotinus. I don't like mixing them personally, so I, I don't. But I do overprint items I'm not happy with. I will print them again. Laura, nothing, nothing takes as long as eucalyptus, but, but onion skins don't mind a long time. So nothing takes as long as eucalyptus. Um, so, um, okay, maybe I, I shouldn't have even mentioned the tumble dryer. Jean, the top, sorry. Um, when you have laid out your wool for wet felting, and you have added your soap and water and 
it's the stage where if you were wet felting by hand, you would be then rubbing the fibers through your bubble wrap or rolling within the bubble wrap. The tumble dryer is substituting for the handwork you would have been doing with your felt. So it is always wet and soapy when it's going into the tumble dryer, never dry. So thank you for clarifying that. You, I have probably confused you. So yeah, so it's always wet. Okay. Um, okay, so some people are going, you're very welcome. Um, I'm, I'm happy that you asked the question, Katie, about the membership, but I don't want anybody to feel that they're under any obligation to join. But if you've enjoyed this, trust me, I think you're going to love the membership. Um, okay, so if does anybody have any other questions now? Because I think it's probably just time to sign off. And I'd like to say a big thank you to Sock again. Thank you so much, Sock, for... Um, for highlighting these questions for me. Um, Kimmy, yes, actually, that is something that I have discovered recently. If you have a clean, dry towel, you can also roll your felt in the towel and that, or any fabric, and that will get some. And that's a really good tip. So thanks, Kimmy, for that. That is a very good tip. So I'm just scrolling down here. Um, OK, Vivian is an interesting thing. So, so Are you saying to actually make the felt, Vivian? Because I would be very, very concerned. <laughs> I would be concerned that that is going to make the fibers shift. But maybe you've done it some way. So it's not something that I would do. But that's quite interesting what you said. Um, and well, Monica, this is fantastic. I'm so pleased that you've enjoyed the ebook, and I'm really excited that you'd be joining me with the next phrase. Uh, I want to just cut through all the all the not misinformation, but all the information and basically give everybody a blueprint for how they can move their their practice forward in the simplest way and get the results they want the quickest. OK. Um, so, Sophie, I have so. You're not Sophie with the wet felting video that I have, it's just two layers of wool. When you are Nuno felting, it's only one layer of wool and one layer of silk fabric. I do have a video about how, a little bit about eco printing, but I haven't got a step-by-step -step tutorial for that. It's not something I can really go into further here now, but it's one layer of silk and one very fine layer of fiber. You're not sandwiching the silk. It's only two layers of things. Okay. Um, Okay, so absolutely, the, <laughs> we're not, because I'm really not, I wasn't intending on answering membership questions today, but since Katie brought it up and we're now on it, I'm going to be answering all the membership questions from Thursday onward. But absolutely, the membership is particularly suited to people who really enjoy eco printing and felting. It's particularly suited to people who enjoy eco printing or felting. Um, and definitely eco printing on linen will definitely be be in that and eco printing on leather later in the summer and things like over dyeing with natural organic indigo. There will be absolutely loads of information, but it's not going to be overwhelming at the beginning. We'll start from the basics. We'll progress forwards. So there'll be more information added regularly. And I'll explain all of that on Thursday. But printing on linen definitely will be included. So. Thank you all very much. Oh, happy St. Bridget's Day. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks, Deborah. Uh, glad you've all enjoyed it. Um, so yes, um, Vivian, you can accept. You can join and there's only a four day window for joining. And then you can stop and you can join with the monthly subscription. But you can't if you decide that it's not for you and you want to stop you can't rejoin until my next intake of people. This will only be opened up once or twice in a year, maybe three times in the future. But that's just so that everybody, you know, when you start, there's a real onboarding, we get to know each other, you see everything in the library, and then all the trainings going forward. I don't want people popping in and out at different times, because then everybody would be starting at different times, and I won't have 
<laughs> any any control over what I'm sharing and people will be at very different stages. So the membership you can join right now on Thursday for $49 a month and you can stop, just give me notice, you can stop you know, and not pay the next month at any stage, but you can't rejoin until there's another intake of people, which will probably be five or six months time, maybe. I'm not 100% sure, but it certainly won't be in the short term. And um, the other thing is if people choose to pay the annual subscription, 490 for the annual subscription, and um, there will be a two week money back guarantee with that. So if you join and you absolutely hate it after the first two weeks, you can get your full money back. I mean, a no quibble guarantee. So um, I just don't want anyone to be disappointed. So um, thank you so much to everybody. I'm having some really nice, um, nice comments here. This is interesting, Leslie. I find they make my hands. I hate how microfiber makes my hands feel, so I don't use them. So that's interesting. A tip for some people to use the microfiber cloths to get up the water. Um, so thank you so much to everybody. Um, here's a lovely comment. Thank you so much. Um, really nice. And I'm so glad that as not a native English speaker that you you found you could follow what was in the book and you're enjoying the videos and I'm, I, I have to apologize about the sound folks I I'm going to have to sort that out before tomorrow night it was something I did at my end and I I don't know what so um uh so no no the membership is not like a daily workshop no so Membership is like implementation of knowledge. So there will be a library with all this information and different things. And then each month we'll have one or two things that we will concentrate on for that month. I'll do a very intensive training. And then two weeks later, a question and an answer. There'll be a private Facebook group, et cetera, et cetera. And I will answer questions, et cetera, for people. But we won't have a daily, a daily meetup or anything. It's implementation of knowledge and sharing of knowledge and me helping you get where you want to go. So it's not like a class on a daily basis. I join back in on Thursday. Don't forget tomorrow. <laughs> but on Thursday, I will have more information. Um, so <laughs> thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, hit that like button. <laughs> Thanks a million. And do please follow my, subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying it. Um, and this is brilliant. Um, oh yes, it, this is really interesting because I actually love ceramics and I have so many handmade, you know, thrown things here and I have beautiful tea bowls and I love using them. And I often think that felt in many ways, it's so elemental. It's actually not dissimilar to, to pottery. I mean, with pottery, you start with clay, but with, with water and your hands and shaping. And you're going to love, 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 love sculptural felt. And that's tomorrow. It's wonderful. Um, so I don't want to push anyone to spend money they don't want to spend. But Valerie, I cannot recommend the ebook enough because that is just, it's got all the information there for you just there as you are. And um, everything is going to be expanded on in the membership, but I, I really do recommend that people, um, if you're in any way interested in eco printing in the dirty pot, the book would be my first point of call. Yes. Uh, you're very welcome, Nancy. Thank you so much uh, for joining in. I'm delighted you're here. And uh, the last comment I'm going to highlight here is, um, Julie, you've had the last say of the day. I'd like to say thank you so much to you all for joining. Apologies about that sound blip. I'll have that sorted before tomorrow night. Thank you so much, Sock, for helping with the moderation and for flagging all the comments. Over and out from Clashin. It's been a pleasure and see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Bye.